My name is Uli Ergen Nidal. I will share the experiences we have on developing heat storage for cooking. First, a bit on the aims and the project background and the types of challenges we've been looking at, the heat storage solutions and heat transfer methods. We've tested concepts in the laboratory, both on direct heat collection methods and indirect using photovoltaic PV. And then finally, some summary at the end. The aim we have is a very simple. We want to contribute to reducing the use of firewood for cooking. So we would like to develop and test concepts for cooking on heat storage, also to avoid the intermittency of the sunshine. And then we want to implement the solutions. The project background is that we've had a very long collaboration with African universities, funded by NORAD programs, on higher education. And these projects have included uh, also work on um, heat storage for cooking. Current partner universities in the NURE projects are universities in Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Malawi, and South Sudan. On the challenges, we have three main challenges. One is the heat storage. What kind of storage could we think of? Secondly is the heat transfer from the sun, direct thermal heat collection or indirect through PV. The third is once you have a heat storage, how do you extract the heat to the cooker? These three are the main challenges we have been working so on the first one on heat storage concepts, we've been looking at latent heat systems with PCM, phase change material, and sensible heat systems. A latent heat system has some benefits in the sense that there is a region in the temperature region where it's reasonably constant in the melting region. So when you charge a latent heat storage, temperature rises until you reach the melting and then it's reasonably constant. So if you operate in this region, you have high energy density and, and quite constant temperatures. We've been using solar salt, these nitrate mixtures being used in solar power plants. The melting temperature is about 220 degrees, which is suitable for cooking and frying purposes. On the sensible heat side, we worked with oil, rock beds, and even simple iron. When you have a sensible heat system, it could be either uniform temperature or you could try to separate the hot and the cold parts. You can try to separate the hot and cold parts in terms of separate containers, one for hot oil and one for cold, or you can keep one single container and try to achieve separation by natural stratification. Hot tends to be on the top, cold at the bottom. The experience we have are essentially that latent heat storage can be suitable for frying. You have a high and a constant temperature and sensible heat storage solutions can be suitable for cooking because you can design the system such that you can regulate the cooking power. On the charging, uh, this is a schematic view of uh, what you typically would expect to have in a direct system where you collect heat directly from the sun and uh, transfer it to a heat storage. So you have a reflector. If you want high temperatures, some concentration is, is needed. Concentrate radiation at this absorber, the focal point, where you convert the sun uh, rays to heat. Then you need a heat 
transfer loop, either by natural circulation or by forced circulation. Once you have a concentrator, you need solar tracking. So this reflector needs to move with the sun in such a way that it always focus on this point, which is a stationary point in the case you have a stationary heat transfer loop. So it's, um, it's a system which works, but tends to become somewhat uh, complex compared to an electrical based system. So this is an electrical based system. You can have power, electrical power given by PV panels or a wind or hydro. And now the transport problem is simple. It's a wire. So you have now heating elements in the, in the storage and it's powered by electrical power. Either as standalone system, you can have standalone PV systems powering this heating elements through a load controller. You can also link up to a battery system such that when the battery is full, a diversion controller routes the incoming power to the storage. So you take care of the excess power from battery systems and store as heat storage for cooking. If you have an inverter, if you're grid connected, you can also use grid power in the end to, to charge the storage. So this, this electrical system tends to be become a bit more simpler. The penalty is that the efficiency of PV panels are quite low. So you need higher collecting surfaces. The last the last question is the heat transfer from the storage to the cooker. And again, you can have circulation loops with a heat transfer fluid, either by natural circulation to the cooker or by a circulation pump. You can put the cooker on a, on a plate which has conducting fins. So now the heat transfer from the storage to the cooker is by conduction in these fins. You can also use a thermosiphon or a heat pipe working in such a way that working fluid, internal working fluid, evaporates in the storage and condenses in the cooker. So the liquid drains by gravity back. Vapor goes up, condenses, liquid goes back. This is a very efficient heat transfer, heat transfer mode. Ideally, the temperature in the cooker, in the condensing area, should be the same as in the evaporator, same pressure. So what have we typically done? We've been evaluating, trying different concepts. And sometimes it's helpful to do some computational evaluation upfront with thermal and flow analysis. Ray tracing has been useful for us and we programmed our own ray tracing, ray tracer. And working with simplified models is also useful, programming in MATLAB. Then we go to the lab, design, construct in the lab. And, and the challenge is essentially to look for simplified solutions. Testing can be done indoor and, and outdoor. Some can be done indoor and, and outdoor. In the end, we want implementation. That is the phase we are approaching now. So in the lab, we produce things, we do testing, outdoor, indoors, we have uh, high capacity lamps. Some types of uh, work can be done with these lamps. We have PV on the roof. We do measurements. This, these are measurements of, of the temperature profile in a rock bed, thermal analysis, ray tracing and ray tracing. So on the concepts, we started with rock bed and air. I thought it was easy, but it was not. 
we have hot air from the absorber, which deposits the heat in a rock bed, and we reverse the flow to extract the heat. So we've been testing absorbers. You need very high temperature difference to get them to get heat into air. We're testing it with uh, fiber-based absorbers or ceramic-based. Very high concentration ratios are needed. We looked at different sizes of the rocks. And this picture also shows you the challenge you have in such a system with a stationary storage and a moving focal point with the sun. Try different geometries, even horizontal rock beds we tested. And we also questioned, could we have PCM heat storage operated with hot air? And uh, a rock bed could serve as a heat transfer media for that. Heat extraction is a particular problem with a rock bed. If you are a baking application, it's fine. You want hot air. But if you want to cook, uh, we ended up with uh, reversing the fan and letting the hot air pass through the cooker through small holes in this top plate. That also gave the opportunity to regulate the cooking energy quite efficiently. Solar tracking is needed. And we arrived at a very simple way of doing that as well by taking two PV panels opposite each other and a motor, tracking motor in between. So we have a shade, which essentially determines which panel drives the motor. Quite simple, giving us a plus minus one degree accuracy in our system, which is good enough for us. And uh, another positive aspect of this was that uh, you could start tracking even at very low solar angles. You were not, you did not necessarily need to be in a small angle from a, of a light diode. Here it's a big flat sensing the sun. Injera fryer, injera is the Ethiopian bread. Uh, frying on PCM with a dish concentrator. So we have a dish focusing on this focal point where a working fluid evaporates, goes up and condenses in, this, in the frying pan. And the frying pan has fins down into the solar salt. Uh, this is a picture in Norway again. It's very high inclination to have this polar mount, much less so when you come closer to the equator. Now this is stationary. The absorber is here and this dish is rotating along the absorber, around the absorber. So we could fry in around this We move now to a trough instead of a dish. So here we have a trough. It focuses on this tube, which is the absorber. And it's oil based. So now we have a system where the heat storage is an oil container, but also having PCM cylinders immersed. Here are the cylinders, a lot of insulation thermocouples for measurements. So the sun heats this tubular absorber, the oil rises, deposits the heat to the PCM cylinders and natural circulation around. Need solar tracking as well. Uh, we could reach the melting temperatures. You needed to add a glass cover on the absorber tube to reduce the convective losses. We could reach the melting temperatures, although when you pass 200 degrees, the energy efficiency tends to decrease, approaching PV values. Direct heating of a modular PCM storage. Now the concept is, let's think in terms of a heat storage, which has 
many small units instead of a big one. So each unit could essentially cook a meal. So now you take one of them, put them in the focal area of a concentrator. And now this focal area is due to a secondary reflector. We have the primary reflects to the secondary, which sends the rains, rays down through the hole onto the heat storage. You need to access solar tracking, but the heat storage is in a, in a stationary location. We did also consider if light guides could be feasible to direct the incoming concentrated solar rays onto an absorber and a heat storage. A light guide is a tube or a, a channel with internal reflecting surfaces. Mechanically it's feasible, you can have a solar polar mount here and a, a pipe in pipe rotation is possible with internal reflecting surfaces. So the ray tracing showed that the number of internal reflections will be very high. So if you increase the length of the light guide, you lose, you lose, um, you lose energy according to losses on each reflection. But if you don't have too long, let's say two meters, if you have a high internal reflectivity, it's feasible according to ray tracing. We did one test with a square channel that was not convincing at all. We put the in inlet in the focal area of the concentrator. And indeed, when we did ray tracing, we realized that a lot of the rays actually came back. So you shoot rays into the reflector, it goes all its way. And, and if you look more closely, a lot of them come back again, almost half of them. But light guides could be a feasible way of collecting or routing the rays, solar rays, straight to the to the absorber, to the heat storage. We've made a direct injera fryer. Now the aspect of the storage is much less significant. The storage is essentially just a thick frying pan holding sufficiently energy to fry one or two injuras. So you now position it manually such that you, you uh, focus on the frying pan here. When it's sufficiently hot, you let the reflector go and it turns upside down and you can go below it and, and fry. You can also change the the geometry of this reflector such that you illuminate this frying pan continuously from the bottom. And that has also been, been made in Ethiopia. But this is a, a very simple way of uh, making a direct fryer without too much uh, concern. We also question this SK-14 is a standard dish reflector used for solar cooking. Can we put a frying pan there instead of the cooker? And we did some measurement and tried. Uh, the conclusion is essentially that this SK-14 is quite deep. So uh, you do receive rays from both the top side and the low side. We did not reach I would say sufficient temperatures for frying. So uh, we did not proceed with SK14 for frying. Uh, <clears throat> we did one test with a CPC as a funnel cooker. A CPC is a compound parabolic concentrator. It's a combination of two parabolas in such a way that it uh, accepts all solar rays within an acceptance angle without solar tracking. If the acceptance angle is large, the 
concentration ratio goes down. So that's the penalty. So the idea was to have a heat storage. We put now a CPC reflector on top of the heat storage. When it's hot, you remove the reflector and you put this insulation on top such that now you have an insulated heat storage to cook on. Now again, we wanted to do this simplified. So we had a look at ray tracing and, and optimized a CPC simplified geometry using eight mirrors. So we put them together and made a test. Uh, we were not convinced of this test that you could get sufficient temperatures for efficient cooking when you had this heat storage uh, positioned uh, in the low. Now, in reality, it will be different geometry. This is a test setup we did to test the concept. In the Norway, the solar angles are low. Then we move to electrical heating, PV based. And a simple way of doing one solution is just to take a heating element, wrap it around an iron cylinder and insulate. So we did that. And you can cook beans on top afterwards. The amount of beans you can cook, can you, you can calibrate to the initial temperature of the storage. So you just leave it there and it cooks uh, until it's finished. Again, we question, can you use PCM now with the uh, heating elements and PV as a, as a source? And this is the concept we tested. We have a container with oil and the PCM cylinders coming into the oil. Heating elements is now in the oil. The evaporator of a heat pipe is in the oil and the vapor goes up and you condense it inside the heating, inside the frying pan and liquid returns by gravity. So we tested this, a barrel in barrel with insulation between, tested a 40 centimeter and a 60 centimeter hollow frying pan. And you could fry in on this. Uh, one positive aspect of having uh, a valve is also that you can shut it off. You can cool down the frying pan and you can scale this energy storage system up to serve uh, several frying pans from one storage. We did a similar type of test on PCM for frying with electrical charging. This is more difficult to scale up. So we took a frying pan, which already had heating elements embedded at the back. We machined the surface, added conducting fins, and put it into a PCM container. So you put power on the heating elements, then you can fry on that power. If you don't fry, the power goes to the storage and you can retrieve it with the fins. This will always be hot, which is a challenge. We solve the stickiness problem by using a, a, a baking ba baking foil which has a Teflon coating. So we could fry in jar on this one without having the stickiness problem. We tested a small scale version of that concept. It's the same, you have a container. Now it was a vacuum insulated container. We have fins coming down into the salt and heating elements attached to the top plate. Now we did a test with a small PV panel, comes into the charge controller. When the battery is full, the power goes to the storage. And we could cook beans in the end on the storage. So even a small power source can during the day accumulate sufficient energy to provide cooking in the evening. 
oil and a rock bed with natural circulation is a concept we have uh, ended up with, so to speak. Now it's charging with heating elements as before, but the heating elements are now inside a funnel which holds the cooker. This funnel and cooker can be inside the storage or outside the storage as in this case. When you have power on the heating element, the oil circulates by itself this way and gradually charges the heat storage side, which is a rock bed. If you do not have power, the circulation will go opposite. You will go this way. So the cooker will cool hot oil, which will come down and replace and the hot comes back to the cooker. Self-circulating and by moving this barrier, you can control the temperature leaving the funnel due to the expansion of the oil. It expands quite a lot with the temperature. So it has some, some positive properties. And, uh, and this version of the system uh, can be upscaled easier. You can even have it have the a rock bed outside the wall. We tried one concept where we tried to separate the hot and oil cold oil, not by natural stratification as in the previous, but now with a piston in a horizontal tubular heat storage. It's difficult to separate hot and cold in a vertical system by a, bound, by a barrier, but in a horizontal you can do it. So now we have a pump driving the flow in this loop where you have heating in this section, either by electrical heating elements or by solar uh, absorbers. So Depending on the positioning, opening and closing of these valves, you can either direct the hot oil to the storage side or to the cooker. When, when this oil is being heated, it comes to a set temperature and this thermostat valve opens and diverts the flow from the circulation to the application or to the storage. So you can choose it by setting these valves. Do you want to charge the storage alone or do you want to cook? If you want to cook, you will pr get the, the cooking power from the heater if it can provide sufficiently, meaning that the thermostat valve is open. If it does not provide sufficient, cold oil will come and push from the cold side of the piston and provide hot oil to the cooker. So we tested this in a small scale system. Uh, concept seems seems to work, but you need quite high precision on on this uh, on this piston. This is the last concept. Now we are also separating hot and cold oil based uh, heat storage. These are drums in drums with insulation in between. So now we have heating elements in this middle tank. So when the oil in this tank becomes hot, the thermostat valve opens and cold oil comes in from the top into the hot tank. So during the day, this hot tank will accumulate hot oil, say 200, 250 degrees. When you want to cook, you open the valve and by by gravity drains through the cooker into this residual tank and when needed you hand pump up again. We've tested different different thermostat valve solutions and again we require that it should be simple and reasonably easy to produce and we ended up with a good solution working with the 
a pipe in pipe configuration and a bimetal spring rotating the inner pipe with the temperature. So in summary, we've tested latent heat and sensible heat storage solutions. Latent heat can be fine for frying. We need high power frying energy at a high temperature for a short time. Sensible heat system can be suitable for cooking where we need to regulate the power. Concentrators have higher energy efficiencies than PV but are more complex. So we are proceeding with PV. Electrical based systems are also open for, uh, for interfacing with the wind and hydro and the grid. It can be standalone or interfaced and you can make sure that you take care of excess energy, not only in electrical batteries, but also now in thermal batteries for cooking. It has been quite a challenge to, and it is a challenge to arrive at simple, robust solutions, which are open for local production and maintenance in a, in a rural African setting. So, the hope is that heat storage solutions for cooking can lead to more widespread adoption of solar-based cooking. Thank you.